factors, we can boil down the various attempts at defining an MEA's effectiveness, in other words, the question how well a treaty works, to three basic questions. First, legal effectiveness. How and to what extent do states actually meet their international commitments under an environmental treaty to which they have become parties? Second, behavioral effectiveness. Which are the measurable positive changes in the environmental policies and practices of states that are attributable to their participation in a treaty? And third, ecological effectiveness. How successfully have the environmental problems targeted by a treaty been solved or mitigated as a result of cooperative action by the contracting states? While the first of these questions invokes the classic pacta sunt servanda maxim from the general law of treaties, the two latter ones correspond to a basic distinction between obligations of means, conduct, behavior, and obligations of result, fulfillment, performance, from the general law of contracts. The three approaches are not mutually exclusive, and they will frequently overlap in any evaluation of a treaty's effectiveness over time. To start with legal effectiveness, output. Concern for the effectiveness of legal instruments has facetiously been described as the holy grail of modern international lawyers. In purely formal terms, to begin with, a treaty becomes effective once it enters into force usually after the stipulated minimum number of ratifications by signatory states have been reached, whereupon it is considered legally binding between the contracting parties. With the treaty membership gradually expanding in the course of subsequent accessions by other states, one simple way of measuring the territorial legal effectiveness of an MEA could be its current geographical range. That range may be expanded by appropriate treaty design. For example, a prohibition of trade with non-member states will reduce the incentive for free riding by outsiders and in fact can be shown to have contributed to effective near universal participation in some MEAs. Yet geographical coverage alone does not tell us anything about the application of an MEA in state practice and about actual compliance by contracting parties with their treaty obligations. Some databases have therefore begun also to record and analyze other indicators for measuring and comparing the performance of member states in applying a treaty. Most multilateral agreements specify the measures to be taken by the contracting parties at the domestic level, with a view to implementing a treaty's objectives. Frequently, those measures are further defined and elaborated in subsequent interpretative resolutions and decisions by the treaty's governing body, such as a conference of the parties. Moreover, as postulated by Agenda 21, a number of agreements now provide for periodic reviews of the performance of states in meeting their treaty commitments on the basis of regular national reports and in some cases on the basis of independent expert assessments. The historical role model for this approach was the system introduced in the 1920s by the International Labour Organization, ILO, to supervise the national application of its conventions and standards, several of which deal with occupational safety and health in the working environment. The mechanisms and systems of implementation review, so established in the field of the environment, serve as a feedback, feedback loop to ensure the continuing effectiveness of the treaties concerned. Along with a range of innovative procedures for identifying, exposing, and in some cases sanctioning non-compliance, they are said to contribute to the development of a culture of compliance in the international environmental regime. Yet, 
as pointed out by critics of a purely legal approach to compliance with a mere letter of treaty obligations, international environmental law is filled with examples of agreements that have had high compliance but limited influence on behavior. Conversely, treaties experiencing significant non-compliance can still be effective if they induce changes in behavior. In a broader view of effectiveness, therefore, legal compliance with the treaty commitment should be distinguished from the extent to which a commitment has actually influenced the behavior of states so as to advance the goals that inspire the treaty. There have been a number of attempts at defining and measuring the effects of multilateral agreements in terms of changing the behavior of states at the level of domestic environmental policies and regulations. The comparative effectiveness surveys undertaken for that purpose, either at the request of a treaty's governing body, by intergovernmental or non-governmental organizations, or as independent ad hoc academic studies, cover a wide range of MEAs as applied in member countries worldwide. Perhaps the longest standing and most elaborate initiative of this kind is the so-called National Legislation Project established by the Conference of Parties to the Conventional International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, CITES, in 1992 and reviewed at each biennial meeting of the conference. Under that system, the national laws of all member states are ranked by the Secretariat in one of three categories. Category 1, legislation believed generally to meet the mandatory requirements for CITES implementation. Category 2, legislation believed to meet only some of the requirements. And Category 3, legislation believed generally not to meet the requirements. Pursuant to the CITES compliance procedures codified by the conference in 2007, states persistently found in category 3 may then become subject to trade sanctions, suspension of all trade in CITES listed species imposed by the Standing Committee. Since 1999, trade bans for inadequate domestic laws were thus imposed on a total of 25 states. In 20 cases, the embargoes resulted in new or amended national regulation systems and were accordingly lifted by the Standing Committee. Five of the embargoes, targeting Somalia, Djibouti, Mauritania, Liberia and Guinea-Bissau, continue in force. The system of collective retortion for a state's failure to comply with the Convention is therefore generally considered as highly effective. In some cases, the mere threat of a trade ban was sufficient to bring about compliance. It must be kept in mind, however, that most of the countries concerned were developing countries, where the real causes of non-compliance are often related to a lack of administrative, technical and financial facilities. The CITES compliance procedures, therefore, provide for a number of prior non-coercive measures, including information assistance, expert advice and capacity building, to induce compliance behavior before recommending default penalties, that is, trade sanctions, as a last resort. Ultimately, the success or failure of a treaty will have to be ascertained by its effect not only on the subsequent behavior of member states, but on its ecological impact, the physical or biological conditions of the environment which the treaty was intended to protect or improve. As pointed out by a comparative study of the implementation of five of the key MEAs in eight selected countries and the EU, countries may be in compliance with the treaty but the treaty may nevertheless be ineffective in attaining, in attaining its objectives. The task of evaluating actual environmental impacts necessarily requires scientific expertise. One difficulty here is that part 
of the assessment will have to be counterfactual. That is, how much worse the situation of the environment would be without the international agreement. The other major difficulty is the establishment of a clear causal connection between the agreement and the perceived impacts, which in most cases may also be potentially attributable to a multitude of extraneous causal factors or to subsequent intervening variables. An indispensable source of information for scientific assessment of a treaty's environmental impacts are the continuous monitoring and reporting schemes introduced by many MEAs. Much depends on the quality and comparability of the data submitted by states, usually on the basis of uniform standard criteria laid down by expert committees under the authority of the treaty's governing body. Yet, the self-reporting systems and monitoring networks so established also raise a problem of reliability in light of the risk of political interference and outright cheating. For example, the sulfur dioxide em emissions, SO2, of Romania in the 1980s turned out to be five times higher than the data officially reported by the government at the time. Ideally, therefore, Monitoring and assessment M&A programs should also be equipped or retrofitted with agreed mechanisms for independent verification. For example, the United Nations Compensation Commission, UNCC, mandated by the UN Security Council in the Resolution 687 in 1991, to deal with the reparation of pollution damages arising from the 1999 Gulf War, proceeded with the help of independent expert scrutiny of all damage claims submitted by governments. As a result, only $5.26 billion were awarded for environmental damages as compared to a total of approximately $85 billion claimed. 